coming on the air tonight with exclusive new reporting from NBC News and a sign the former president, Donald Trump, could maybe be indicted as early as next week, with multiple officials telling us law enforcement agencies are getting ready for something like that as we speak. What Mr. Trump is saying tonight and where he's saying it coming up. Plus, NBC News learning about a new investigation into TikTok's parent company, an investigation for allegedly spying on American journalists. How TikTok's now trying to get on offense before next week's big congressional hearing. And an arrest warrant now out for Russian President Vladimir Putin, formally accused of war crimes in Ukraine. What the Kremlin is saying tonight and what it means for the Chinese president's visit to Russia next week. And speaking of China, some new evidence today links raccoon dogs to the COVID pandemic. We'll tell you what we're hearing from international virus experts coming up. And in just a couple of hours from now, Taylor Swift is kicking off that ERA's tour. We are live in Swift City, Arizona, with what we know about her return to the stage and those ticket prices that may not feel so good. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight there's a new signal and some exclusive reporting to suggest that former President Donald Trump could maybe face criminal charges as early as next week, because NBC News has learned that law enforcement agencies are getting ready for exactly that scenario, according to five senior law enforcement sources familiar with those preparations. This means there is the potential the potential for an indictment related to alleged hush money payments Mr. Trump made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. So let's lay out what we know. Local, state, and federal agencies are all working to get a security plan together if the indictment comes out and if the former president comes to that Manhattan courthouse to face those charges, according to sources. Remember, this would be unprecedented. Right, this would be historic in a big way. There has never been a former president who's been criminally charged like this before. And to be clear, we keep saying if, if, because that is just where the facts are right now. No charges have been filed yet. We don't know for sure that they will be. But still, Mr. Trump is already trying to get ahead of whatever might be about to come down. He's posting a couple videos on his Truth Social platform, yet again, framing the investigations into him as politically motivated. Calling the whole thing, in his words, the most disgusting witch hunt in the history of our country. John Allen is on the Trump beat for us tonight. He is joining us now. We've talked a little bit about what we know. There's a lot of questions on what we don't know here, John. Bring us up to speed. <laughs> Always love to outline what we don't know, Hallie. Uh, in this case, it's a lot. We don't know uh, if there will be an indictment. We don't know when there will be an indictment. We do know uh, sort of what the process is for this. If there is an indictment, uh, you know, the, basically, if 12 of the jurors on the grand jury, uh, you know, move for an indictment, vote for an indictment, uh, that goes forward. There's a little bit of a process where uh, where the prosecutors would reach out to the defense to try to arrange an arraignment and a booking, that kind of thing. Uh, but one of the things we don't know is Will, in fact, uh, Donald Trump be brought in to be fingerprinted and, fingerprinted and photographed like any other uh, person who is indicted, if he's indicted, or perhaps might they make uh, some sort of special accommodation, uh, perhaps send agents down to Mar-a-Lago or meet somewhere else in private, um, you know, uh, because of, to your point, this unprecedented nature of a possible indictment of a former president. Would they do that, John? I mean, is that even in the realm of possibility here? And I don't want to get us out over our skis, but I think that's a you know, question that people might have. I think everything's in the realm of possibility, Hallie, because hmm. we just haven't seen it before. Um, it's certainly something that's doable, I mean, logistically doable. In fact, it's probably easier logistics for uh, law, law enforcement to come to him instead of Trump to go uh, into a courthouse. That said, uh, no reason to no reason to think that that's what will happen, but certainly, um, you know, there's no limit on the possibilities uh, yeah. at this point. I'll tell you, I've been talking, um, as you have been, with, with sort of sources in the Trump orbit, let's say, about whatever may happen now in the next TBD period of time. And it seems to me like there are a couple of defense strategies that are getting put out there, right? One is like a political defense strategy. You're seeing that from Donald Trump. One is a legal defense strategy, the way they may legally try to push back against an indictment if it were to come on these hush money payments. Talking about the first one of those, right, the political defense strategy here. They're going to try to paint Michael Cohen, who is tangentially involved in this. He's been testifying in front of the grand jury as not a credible person. They're going to try to paint him as a liar. And Donald Trump is going to do what he's doing today, which is to say that this is all politically motivated against him. This is part of his playbook when there are investigations into him. We have seen this before. What's also interesting is where he's making this case. He's posting for the first time on Facebook today. That's a platform he hasn't been on in years. Yeah, he says, I'm back, Hallie. And to your point, 
the political argument here is the one Donald Trump has been making that we, uh, you know, that we've been hearing for years, which is uh, when allegations are made against him, it's because uh, the, his enemies are after him, that it's a witch hunt, that he didn't do anything wrong, uh, and he's able to, at least has been in the past at times, able to turn that uh, into essentially a positive for his base to rile up his base to get political supporters behind him. Um, you know, what's fascinating about him being back on Facebook right now is, uh, unlike your Facebook page or my Facebook page, uh, with Donald Trump, he is capable of getting a, uh, you know, a message out around the world very quickly now that he's back on Facebook and raising money. This is very important for him politically. His platform has been somewhat diminished by the fact that he's been off of social media sites uh, like Facebook and Twitter since January 6th. Now hitting Facebook again, hugely important for his ability to raise money and communicate with his supporters. John Allen, thank you very much. Brian, on top of that, appreciate it. One of the world's most popular apps, one that might be on your phone right now, TikTok and its parent company, are now under investigation for possible spying. According to law enforcement sources, uh, one law enforcement source telling us that there is a DOJ and FBI investigation into the Chinese company ByteDance, which owns TikTok, with allegations that those employees got into the data of American journalists. Now, ByteDance, in a statement to NBC News, says they fired the employees responsible for the alleged scheme and are going to cooperate with the investigation against them. But all of this comes as the Biden administration is taking a tougher tone against TikTok, giving ByteDance, its parent company, this kind of ultimatum, saying, like, hey, either sell off TikTok or face a ban on TikTok in this country. That means the 100 million of, million of you, right, the 100 million Americans with TikTok on your phone, You'd be out of luck. It's all happening not too long before what is going to be an explosive hearing on Capitol Hill when the CEO of TikTok testifies in front of a House committee for the very first time. NBC's Sahil Kapoor is joining us now. Talk to us about what this investigation is, what prosecutors are looking for, and the allegations here, because it seems to center around the fact that uh, ByteDance has acknowledged that a couple of journalists were basically tracked by ByteDance employees who now no longer work for that company, but that is creating some concern, and it seems like that's at the heart of this new DOJ FBI investigation. That's right, Hallie. Here's what we know at this point. The Justice Department and FBI are investigating TikTok and its parent company, ByteDance, on matters, including these reports, that it spied on journalists and improperly accessed their data. Now, how did this come about? It's important to know. Let's put up a chart on the screen that explains how uh, this all came to be. First, there was a, 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 an employee noticed internal leaks from TikTok. Then they gained access to the journalists' IP addresses, including data through their TikTok account. Then they gained access to the data of the journalists' contacts, and then they used the data to determine proximity with ByteDance employees. Now, this all began with a Forbes investigation by one of the journalists who said she was among those uh, who were spied on uh, as part of this whole process. The FBI and the DOJ have declined to comment, and uh, you know, ByteDance, a spokesperson, defending themselves, saying that they've gotten rid of the employee and promising that they will cooperate with investigations going forward, uh, that they say they will investigation is ongoing internally and they will cooperate with any official investigations when brought to us, unquote. So, Saha, what's also interesting here is that TikTok is looking to go on offense, right, ahead of this big hearing that we referenced with TikTok CEO next week on Capitol Hill. We understand from a spokesperson that creators, like that's the name for the people who do the stuff on the TikToks, and then you look at it, like creators are going to come to Washington um, for sort of this, this big push ahead of this hearing to try to say, hey, like this is what we do, this is why we're so popular, et cetera. This is all wrapped up in, in kind of the politics with lawmakers having some concerns that TikTok might violate with its Chinese ownership, privacy concerns for Americans, maybe there's a propaganda concern if the Chinese could spread propaganda through the app here. Hallie, it's notable that TikTok is not making very many friends here on Capitol Hill. Remarkable, especially for an app that is so popular that has, as you point out, an estimated more than 100 million uh, American users. And these latest reports in this investigation are not going to help their cause. Now, next week, the House Energy and Commerce Committee is hosting a, a hearing uh, that will put TikTok sh uh, CEO Sho Chu in the hot seat. That investigation, uh, according to uh, the committee chair, Kathy McMorris-Rogers, will be called 
how Congress can safeguard American data privacy, protect children from online harms. They will investigate, among other things, consumer privacy, practices on data security, the platform's impact on children, and, of course, its links to the Chinese Communist Party. We asked a group of us reporters, uh, spoke to Speaker Kevin McCarthy earlier today, asked him if TikTok was a national security risk. He responded simply, yes. Allie? In a word, that's how he feels. Sahil Kapoor, thank you very much for that. Appreciate it. The White House tonight saying in a new statement that Russia must be held accountable for war crimes and atrocities in Ukraine after the International Criminal Court issued a warrant for the arrest of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. They're accusing him of crimes, crimes like illegally deporting and moving thousands of children from Ukraine to Russia. The Kremlin has long denied that they've forced kids and adults to move, but another top Russian official is now facing similar charges. What is the reaction from the Kremlin? Frankly, they're kind of brushing it off. Their foreign minister spokesperson saying that the country does not cooperate with the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and that any kind of warrant, they put that in quotes, will be legally null and void for the country. It comes on the same day we're learning more about the Chinese president's visit to Russia early next week. It'll be Monday through Wednesday. We have marked our calendars. You should mark yours because it's going to be Xi Jinping's first time in Russia since Putin invaded Ukraine. And it comes at this really important moment when the tensions between the U.S. and Russia and China are building and building. Our White House correspondent Ali Rafa is joining us here now in studio. What's interesting about this, Russia is kind of blowing this off, saying, well, we don't really cooperate with the ICC. In all practicality, it's not expected that this warrant is going to have much teeth in reality, but it is a major symbolic move that the ICC is saying, Vladimir Putin, we want to charge you with these war crimes especially when he's been accused of war crimes for years now. And the Biden administration is underscoring that, saying this is a very big step, but it is the smallest step that the ICC, which they say is acting as an independent actor for the time being, can take right now. Um, I believe we have a piece of sound from uh, National Security Council spokesperson uh, John Kirby about this uh, from what he said earlier today. Make no mistake, Kristen, Russia has been committing war crimes, as we've said, even crimes against humanity. We're going to look for ways and make sure that Russia is held accountable for the war crimes, for the atrocities that they are perpetrating against the Ukrainian people. And Hallie K Kirby also said that this isn't going to be quick. It's not going to be easy, especially when you consider the amount of evidence it's going to take uh, to painstakingly collect it, to preserve it, if this high-stakes, high-profile trial ever does make it to fruition. And we talked about how this is coming just days before the Chinese leader's visit to Russia, also important on the international stage. It seems like China is trying to flex its muscles in this role as peacemaker, right, to maybe broker some kind of a deal between Ukraine and Russia. There's a lot of skepticism that could actually happen, but there's also a lot at stake. A lot at stake. And it's, it's notable considering that John Kirby also said today he's taming expectations. He's saying, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Mm. Let's not expect so much out of this meeting because we know how convenient this is for Russia considering the point they are at in this war. They need military aid. They know China is one of the allies that could provide it. China, we know from U.S. officials, it, they have evidence that China is considering sending lethal aid to Russia. But all of this coming as China brokers these sort of peace deals when they really haven't taken such a strong stand against what Russia has done. They haven't acknowledged the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, they have condemned sanctions by the U.S. on Russia. So it's really a question of where, how sincere is this effort by China at this point? There's also this push by, I think, the Western community, right, by Western allies of Ukraine to isolate Russia more and more. We're seeing that a little bit with, not to get complicated here, but Turkey opening the door to Finland joining NATO. The reason why that matters, like the reason why that's interesting, is because Russia doesn't want Finland in NATO. And today, we also heard about Slovakia and Poland also sending fighter jets. So it's widening this gap of Western aid, Western mm. allies versus China and China's allies and where that stands. Uh, Kirby also setting expectations on that as well. Uh, not really clear where that could lead. But as we see uh, these peace talks, you know, uh, China saying that they want these peace talks, we have also heard from John Kirby and the Biden administration that they want to see the same effort if they are sincere sincere in these efforts for peace, the same efforts to talk to Ukraine and President Zelensky mm. that we're seeing efforts being reached out to, to Russia. For right. That. They're saying, if you're going to talk to Putin, exactly. talk to Zelensky, too. Ali Rafa, thank you very much. Good to see you.
Thank you. Over on Wall Street, let's talk about money because the stock market, a little bit shaky tonight heading into the weekend with concerns still over the state of the U.S. banking system and the president now putting the ball in Congress's court. He's asking them to pass something to prevent drama like this from happening again. You've got the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ all down in the red. Look at the Dow down like 1.2% down nearly 400 points. You've got the president saying in a statement today he wants Congress to green light a bill to make it easier for the government to punish executives involved in bank failures. He says no one is above the law. But some members of Congress aren't so sure that a new law is going to be the solution here. Listen. Well, I think you want to get all the facts, but it seems as though the regulators didn't do their job. I don't know what it means. Mr. Speaker, you know, Tough to hear Kevin McCarthy there, but he basically says, well, that that may not be it. He's not so sure that's the solve. Tonight, there's also some new fallout. Even a week after the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, its parent company is now filing for bankruptcy protection. Brian Chung remains on the financial drama beat. Um, and Brian, it's not going anywhere anytime soon, right? Because the president wants Congress to do a couple of big things to stop this from happening again. Is it realistic? Do you think it'll go anywhere? Yeah, let's recap exactly what the president is asking for here. Again, all of this is supposed to be uh, providing a little bit more accountability on executives of failed banks. So when you take a look at the detail of what he's proposing, Specifically, it's first of all, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corp Corporation, he wants them to have more ability to claw back bonuses from CEOs of failed banks. And he also wants to lower the threshold by which you can bar bank executives from a future employment at other banks, even after uh, allowing a bank to fail. And then lastly, giving regulators more authority to sue bank executives for civil penalties. It's not that the FDIC and regulators can't do this right now. It's that there are some uh, technicalities around the size of the bank that fails in the way that the bank is ultimately uh, resolved that allows these regulators to only pursue these types of punitive uh, uh, measures. But again, the Biden administration wanting to lower that, but it's going to require an act of Congress. It'll be interesting to see if he can do that in a mixed Congress, especially with that quote we just heard from Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> I don't have to. It is now breaking news to people watching this show that it is Friday night, right? But what's interesting as we head into this weekend is to think about last weekend. And last weekend, there were a lot of people freaking out because there were huge question marks about what was going to happen with that bank collapse, whether the administration was going to step in. We know what happened there. You had 11 banks kind of riding to the rescue. Recently, a First Republic bank, a different bank people were worried about. Their shares dipped again today. Getting out of the weeds a little bit, like tell us what the expectation is for, let's say, next week. Are people going to be in panic mode? Is it time to like take a deep breath here? Help us understand that. Yeah, on a personal note, I mean, this week has felt like a year. There's been so much stuff that happened. But yeah, I mean, it's only last weekend that we I saw this. Wait, two Brian, I love that you preface that with on a personal note. Yeah, like for, for everybody, though, right? I mean, for, for you reporting it, but for people who have money in the markets, too, you know? Yeah, but I mean, you know, look, when we look at the stock market, just like how the stock market is not the economy, well, right. Bank stocks are not the health, uh, a metric of health for these banks. And we have to remember that if an investor is looking at the banking uh, industry right now and saying, I don't want to be exposed to this bank, well, then they're going to sell the stock. That's not necessarily a referendum on whether or not they feel that bank has proper liquidity or has proper capital. And that's really important to remember as we watch the sell-off, for example, in the stocks that happened on this Friday. The overall stock market fell, but yeah. the bank stocks got shellacked as well. That's going to be an interesting thread to watch next week, but it's going to be very noisy because we have a lot of economic threads to pull as well. Federal Reserve has a meeting that will decide on interest rates Oof. on Wednesday. That's right. So we're going to be teeing up to that, I am sure, for much of the week. What's the over-under on your cocktails tonight when you get home, Brian? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, let's say two. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. <laughs> See you next week. Yep. So listen, there's a new sign tonight that Hunter Biden's legal team is shifting to a more aggressive strategy, going on offense and filing a lawsuit, a countersuit for invasion of privacy against one of the people who they say accessed Hunter Biden's data and that so-called laptop without permission. You have Mr. Biden's legal team targeting the owner of a computer repair shop for invasion of privacy. And that all appears to be part of a broader push by the team around the president's son in the face of House Republicans ramping up their own high profile investigations into Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden's team has already sent letters to 14 people, including Rudy Giuliani and Steve Bannon, Trump allies there, right? Asking them to preserve potential evidence for future lawsuits related to what they describe as the alleged theft of personal data. Delaware Attorney General, Department of Justice, a spokesperson for Hunter Biden did not respond to a request for comment.
previously has told NBC News that Hunter Biden has spent the last several years being the subject of investigations and exhaustive media scrutiny while also telling his story in a detailed memoir. He has nothing to hide. Sarah Fitzpatrick is joining us now. And Sarah, um, it, it's laid out right there, right? It's been a couple of years of Hunter Biden's team kind of not saying much as this laptop data, right, or data from Hunter Biden has been out there. Um, now, the ramping up, the, the countersuit that's been filed, these letters that have been sent out, this is a shift for them. It's a major shift. It's a major shift, and I think it's a very deliberate strategy that has been in the works for years, but we're seeing play out every week something new. Mm. And this week, I think we're really seeing you know, this desire to put it on the record, to have a countersuit, to get people under oath, to document what these Trump allies have said publicly by their own admission. And I think that the effort to do that documentation is an effort to create a record not just for civil courts, not just for Congress, but for criminal prosecutors as well. That's what they think. That's where they think this may be going. Here. Absolutely. There's also the sort of why now aspect of it. And you have to think it's connected to what's happening in the building just a couple blocks from where we are, the Capitol, with these Republican-led investigations uh, ramping up. And it seems like every couple of days there's a new drip, drip, drip on something related to Hunter Biden. Is that part of the thinking from the sources you're talking to on the Hunter Biden team here? I think it's absolutely part of the thinking, but it's kind of on a parallel track. Hunter Biden's team has not engaged publicly with Congress yet. They are still mm. kind of stepping back and playing this out in the civil courts. But it is an effort to demonstrate, have this record that they can show to Congress uh, what is factual and what is not factual, what's been established and what hasn't. And I think it's an effort to show that Hunter Biden is not going to stand by with kind of attacks that they find to be baseless, that there is going to be a more aggressive posture going forward. Sarah Fitzpatrick, the tip of the spear for us on all of this reporting. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate you. The FBI tonight offering a $20,000 reward for any information on a missing American woman who they say got kidnapped in Mexico. Remember, this is after four Americans were just kidnapped at gunpoint in Mexico in a case of mistaken identity. That turned deadly. Two of them were killed. And right now, three other women from Texas are missing after crossing the border into Mexico to sell clothes back in February. That sounds like a lot, right? But it's not just these cases. You've got The Washington Post reporting something like 550 Americans are missing right now in Mexico. Just today, over on MSNBC, our own Jose diaz Bilar talked with a mom whose son has been missing after going to Mexico six years ago. Listen. We need action to be done. The paperwork has been done. All we need is action. The families need action done. Just that is the million dollar question is why hasn't it been done for our family members? I want to bring in Dana Griffin, who is covering this for us now. And Dana, talk us through as we are looking, of course, um, at, at everything happening here as you're live for us in L.A. What else can you tell us about this missing woman and the other Americans who are missing in Mexico? Yeah, Hallie, 63-year-old Maria del Carmen Lopez was taken from her home in Mexico, get this, 36 days ago. Now, she's a great grandmother who frequently goes back and forth from Mexico to Southern California. Her daughter says that there were witnesses during this midday kidnapping and there was a ransom demand. And here's how she describes how it all went down. They got off of the truck. They had their, they had hoods on their heads and they exchanged some words they said they did hear my mom say and plead that she was not going to go with them she would not go and as you mentioned hallie the fbi is offering a twenty thousand dollar reward for information now the agency has a long-standing policy of not paying ransoms however they do help facilitate if a victim's family chooses to pay hallie all of it's happening as we're learning more about the, the relationship right between the U.S. and Mexico as it relates to something else, and that is um, cooperation on how to handle the flow of drugs across the border, right? How to tackle cooperation mm -hmm. on how to tackle fentanyl specifically seems to be at the lowest point that it's been in a long time. Help us understand that. Yeah, yeah, so today Mexico's president actually said that the U.S. U.S. families are to blame for the fentanyl overdose crisis because they don't hug their kids enough. He has also falsely stated that none of the dangerous drug is processed in Mexico. Here's what drug trafficking expert Vanda Felbad Brown had to say about that. I don't think we have that sound, Dana, but clearly experts have some major okay. concerns about needing to have this cooperation between the U.S. and Mexico, right? Because there is a sense that it is only through cooperation that there will be any solutions here. 
Exactly. And so the synthetic opioid, which is trafficked by Mexican cartels, has been blamed for about 70,000 overdose, overdose deaths per year in the U.S. That's pretty staggering, Hallie. Dana Griffin, live for us there in L.A. Dana, thank you very much. Coming up here on the show, what disgraced Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes is doing to try to stay out of prison for now, at least. What we've just heard from the judge in her case tonight. Plus, I, I promise this is not the beginning of a Mad Lib. Rolls-Royce nuclear reactor moon mission. These are all related in one story coming up in the five things. Just a minute. Remember Elizabeth Holmes, the disgraced Theranos founder who was sentenced to prison for lying about her company and what would have been some groundbreaking blood test technology. She now, tonight, is asking to report to prison later than she was originally set to. And now a judge is saying they're going to need more time to, to figure out if they're going to do that or not. Holmes made a lot of news when she asked to stay out of prison because she was arguing, in part, that she should not be in prison while she was raising a newborn. She gave birth to her second child not too long ago, just within the last couple of months. This was all just a part of her lawyer's motion where they say she's not a flight risk or a danger to the community. Holmes had told everybody, including top investors, that she'd created a system to detect a variety of health issues with a single drop of blood. It was, as we've now seen pretty much everywhere, a total lie. And that, of course, is fraud. She was hit with a more than 11-year sentence for her lies to those investors. Now, if the judge rules against Holmes next month, she'll have to report to prison at the end of April. Holmes would, of course, not be the first parent who would have to go to prison. Studies show that about 58,000 still pregnant women are admitted to prisons and jails every year, and that 60% of women in America's prison are parents, 80% in jails are parents. Attorney and legal analyst Angela Senadella is joining us now. So, Angela, the judge says he needs some time to think about this, right? How do arguments like hers usually go? Can we read any tea leaves from the lawyer's briefs and the judge's response here? Well, it's hard to tell because the judge usually balances a couple of things. First, the judge will look at the extenuating circumstances. And actually, in fact, judges can take into effect or into account the fact that she does have small children. If you look at the fact that the judge didn't even start her sentence until the end of April, when actually the hearing was in November, most people think that that large amount of time was due to the fact that she was going to have a baby and going to bond with that baby. Now, balancing that is, of course, what you mentioned, which is the flight risk. And Prosecutors here say, look, she bought a ticket to Mexico last year, a one-way ticket, and only alerted authorities after they found out first. So they're saying she might just go. And on the alternative, her side is saying, no, she has a newborn. She's not going to go anywhere. She's not a flight risk. It's the humane thing to do to allow her to delay her sentence until the appeal. Has there been any question of privilege here when it comes to this, Angela? In other words, Holmes, it, before obviously all of this happened, she was making, you know, good money. She is a white woman in America. Is that is that a, a part of the discussion around this at all and why this made so many headlines, this request? I, I think absolutely. The fact that her defense team is so significant, so substantial, so qualified, and is able to continually make these appeals really does speak to her resources. But at the same time, it's not clear that the judge will actually rule in her favor because of wealth, because of race, etc. Because sometimes the judge can say, well, look, you do have resources. This child, when the, when the child grows up, will not be alone. And so sometimes the judge will actually rule, give more leniency to families that don't have two parents or that have less resources. Angela Zanadella, thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, there is so much anger in France today after President Emmanuel Macron forced that super unpopular retirement change plan through Parliament with no vote. You see some of the protests that happened in and around Paris and elsewhere in France today. This is a plan that raises the retirement age from 62 to 64, and obviously, you can see, demonstrators are not happy. Workers have been on strike for weeks now. It's messing up transportation there, things like trash collection, and labor leaders say, hey, we want new demonstrations, too. Number two, police at the northern border are warning about a record number of migrant crossings from Canada. 
These migrants are mainly from Mexico. They can legally get to Canada without visas before attempting to illegally cross into the U.S. Border Patrol says about 2,000 people made that cold and dangerous trip this winter, nearly 10 times what it was this time last year. Number three, Derek Chauvin, the Minneapolis police officer who killed George Floyd, just pleaded guilty to two counts of tax evasion. Prosecutors say Chauvin and his now ex-wife underreported their joint income by about half a million dollars, just shy of that. Chauvin's been sentenced to 13 months in prison for those counts, which will run at the same time as the sentence he's already serving for Floyd's death. His ex-wife pleaded guilty last month. Number four, the space agency over in the UK is backing a plan by Rolls-Royce to build a nuclear reactor on the moon. They're pitching in about three and a half million bucks toward a micro reactor that could help power a future moon base. How about that? Number five, did you know it's St. Patrick's Day? I'm sure you did, because if you are like everybody in this office, you are wearing green. The White House is wearing green as well. And you saw President Biden celebrating with the prime minister of Ireland. He gave the president a big bowl of shamrocks and to keep the festivities going. Former One Direction member Niall Horan will give a special performance. They even dyed the fountain there on the South Lawn green. When we come back, new data linking raccoon dogs to early COVID cases in China. While we're still learning clues, hints, signals about where the pandemic may have started even three years later, more on that coming up. of the EPA today saying how long he thinks cleanup will take at that toxic train derailment site in East Palestine, Ohio. We'll tell you when it should be finished. The answer all those locals want to know later in the local. But first, some new evidence tonight could give us another clue into the mystery of how the pandemic started. And this latest hint links it to a market in Wuhan, China. Virus experts say they found genetic data that ties the origins of COVID to raccoon dogs. Raccoon dogs who were for sale at that Wuhan market as part of an illegal wildlife trade. Why does that matter, right? What I just said, that could support the theory that COVID jumped from animals, these raccoon dogs, to humans. Why does that matter? Why is that significant? There is a competing theory that the pandemic actually started when the COVID virus was leaked from a lab. That theory has been backed by some, but not all, U.S. intelligence agencies, the Energy Department, for example, even with what they call low confidence. If you've never heard of a raccoon dog before, they're pretty small. They're about 15 pounds. You're looking at some. They are bred and sold in China for their meat and fur, and they're known to be able to transmit the coronavirus to other animals through direct contact. Stephanie Gosk joins us now. Uh, this is interesting for a lot of reasons, Steph, and we're going to get yeah. into it, but let's let's start with the evidence that the researchers found. What is it? How do we know about it? Walk us through it. Let's start with that raccoon dog. Do we think the raccoon dog's cute? I don't know. Um, the jury is still out on that, um, as is the jury on where the origins of COVID come from. But this is a step in the direction, some say, to prove that COVID jumped from animals to humans. And the information comes from samples that were gathered at that market by the Chinese government. They were then analyzed. There were genetic sequences put together. And those genetic sequences popped up on a publicly available server that could be accessed by scientists, downloaded. And then they found from these samples that, that the COVID positive samples also had genetic sequencing from these dogs. Now, that's why they can go that next step and say, well, we believe it is likely that there were infected raccoon dogs in this market in the early days of the pandemic spread. And that's why we're here having this conversation right now, Hallie. But it, what it is not, I mean, what you're laying out, Steph, is a hint. What it is not is a smoking gun, right? Well, the, you know, the, the, the problem is that the samples don't actually come from the dogs. And there are a lot of people out there that want to get this question done and dusted. They don't care whether it was the lab or the mm. market. They want to know for sure this isn't that and, and might make some people upset who are already upset about this question. I, I talked to a virologist who had this to say about what this information does and doesn't prove. It's not conclusive because you can't prove the chain of events for how an animal got infected. You can't even technically prove the raccoon dog was infected. So it, it, that's not going to be really satisfying for people. And, you know, they, another interesting thing to point out is that this information that was on this publicly available website 
has since been taken down, and it's a little unclear who took it down. What? what? Yeah. Uh, what? There is some theory that it might be the Chinese government. This, this idea that it came from the market, as you hinted at, this is an illegal trade. The Chinese government does not want that public, they, especially because there have been, been viruses in the past that have been linked to that trade. It was supposed to be shut down. So there's there, there's a lot of criticism there, and as we know, the Chinese government has not been particularly open about this process. Right. They've not called on for a, an independent investigation. So, you know, there are a lot of questions but, here. Well, and what you're talking about, Steph, though, so directly relates to where I am sitting here in Washington, D.C., which is this idea that um, intelligence officials, lawmakers, you know, scientists in this country have sort of pointed at China for years now and said, I mean, really, Steph, as you know, from the start, and said, you are a roadblock, basically. They're not saying it in such direct terms, but that's the idea. They're saying China is the roadblock to actually trying to figure out this mystery because it is just not being transparent. It's also worth pointing out, too, why are we fixated with this question? We are fixated with this question because mm -hmm. we want to stop the next pandemic, right? So if the Chinese government is worried about saving face in light of some uncomfortable information, that's one thing. But we want to get to the bottom of it, politics aside, to try to keep it from happening again. Stephanie Gosk, uh, it is fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. We're going to look for more of it tonight on Nightly News with Lester Holt when Steph is there, 6.30 Eastern, wherever you watch your local NBC affiliate. Coming up here on our NBC News Now channel, the World Cup in Qatar ended months ago, but FIFA is still right now trying to address allegations about what happened behind the scenes at the tournament. We'll tell you what's going down in Rwanda today. Plus, do you have money on March Madness? I bet you do, because tens of millions of people are betting on these games. We're talking about how this idea, sports gambling, has exploded in this country later on this hour. Okay, I bet you remember the thing we're about to show you from back in December, the World Cup final, Argentina beating France. Messi getting that championship trophy in Qatar, big news, right? Big, exciting news, but there was a shadow hanging over these games, right? Calls like this one to boycott Qatar last year because of what you see here, human rights, questions, abuses. And today you've got FIFA wrapping up a meeting in Rwanda where they tried to ab address the abuse that human rights groups say ranged from wage theft to dangerous conditions that ended with workers dying. FIFA now approving a fund set up to pay victims of the alleged violations. Megan Fitzgerald is joining us now. She covered every minute of that World Cup. So, Megan, talk us through this latest development, right? What these workers are asking for. Well, Holly, first, to put it into perspective, the FIFA president said in December that they made $7.5 billion, $7.5 billion from the 2022 games. So uh, we have this letter that's been signed by over a million people demanding compensation for the families of those who lost loved ones uh, and, and for the migrant workers. They want a sliver of that pie. They are asking for compensation. They're asking for a plan of when they can receive this compensation and a timeline for when they will get it. Now, like you mentioned, you know, I was in Qatar, and you could see that a lot of the infrastructure looked new because it was new. We're talking about all this being built within a, a decade. So uh, the stadiums, seven stadiums that were built. We know that roads and bridges, uh, a train system, an airport all built. And these human rights organizations are saying that people lost their lives during this. They had to work in inhumane work conditions. Uh, they were uh, missing wages. Uh, and so right now, the pressure is mounting for compensation here. There's also a piece of this with FIFA meeting in Rwanda now today. This is another country with questions, of course, around human rights. Talk through the optics of this for FIFA. Yeah, you know, you're right to point that out. Optics not looking good. But again, you know, it, it really can't be overstated just how much the pressure is mounting here. More than a million people signing this letter from over 190 different countries. People that are recognizing and saying, look, what went into building up the World Cup, Qatar, to be able to host the World Cup, isn't fair. Compensation needs to be uh, doled out to these families and to these workers. But then, of course, you also have the Norwegian Football Association. They have also sent a letter to FIFA asking them to assess uh, how and, and if they remedied the situation. That's something that will be discussed on Thursday. So we will see, Hallie, if that's enough uh, to move the needle any. That is for sure. Megan Fitzgerald, thank you very much for sitting on top of this one for us. Appreciate it. 
NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. From our Midwest Bureau, the EPA administrator is finally given a timeline for cleanup of that East Palestine train derailment in Ohio. Three months. That's how long it's going to take. The agency says a lot of progress has been made so far, and that nearly half of the dirt that was contaminated under the track has been removed. They're also pointing out stuff like weather, stuff like access to places to get rid of this dirt could slow things down. So we'll watch that. Also from our Midwest Bureau, 400,000 gallons of radioactive water has leaked from a nuclear plant in Minnesota. The company that runs the plant says they acted fast to contain the leak and that there's no danger to the public. The State Department of Health says they are monitoring the cleanup. From our Western Bureau, Yosemite National Park will reopen, not fully, Hours will be cut, access will be cut, but it'll at least reopen after being shut for three weeks because of those really bad storms that messed up some of the roads there, some of the other facilities. Lucky for people in California, they can get back into that majestic park once again. So listen, some changes could be coming to the census because the White House is looking at changing up how the government tracks the racial and ethnic identities of people who live in this country. Why does that matter, right? If you're like, oh my God, Hallie, you said the word census, I just fell asleep. Like, here's why this is so important. It literally matters to your life because it determines things like what you get from the federal government, right? Based on where you live, how many people are where you live, et cetera. Like this actually has an impact of your life. It's happening partly because there's this big push for more accurate categories for how people identify themselves on forms like the census. Some of the changes could look like new categories for people of Middle Eastern and North African descent, less confusing categories for Hispanic people. I want to bring in Tremaine Lee, who's following this for us. The White House is paying attention to this. They've got a lot of people talking about it there. And a change like this hasn't happened in I, like 20, 20 years, just about, if not longer, right? This could be a big deal. That's right, it really could, Hallie. And it could go a long way in breaking down some of the, the binaries and the buckets we have for race in America, right? Right now, in terms of like the federal government, you have white, black, American Indian, you know, um, Native Hawaiian, um, but that's pretty narrow. So, for example, if you're one person and you have Irish descent and another person is Egyptian or Libyan, they're encouraged to check white. Right. But if you're you're black or African-American for, for the census purposes, if you are a Jamaican immigrant who got here in 2022 and then another person is a black person whose family goes back to the 1800s in Georgia and came up through the Great Migration in 1922, you're both black. And so this push to, to mm. kind of create new categories um, and for the government to lose language like majority and minority, um, it's a pretty big deal. The, and the dropping of the term is majority and minority matter here, right, in a lot of different ways, it, 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 in the way that conversations are framed on the national level. We said this in the introduction to you, Tremaine, like, I, I know, I know that people hear census and they're like, oh, my God, this is so boring. But, like, again, this really does have an impact in people's lives because the conversation that happens here where we are in Washington. Well, well first of all, if you're trying to, uh, you know, have a specific remedy for a specific group of people, it helps to be very specific. But in terms of the ideas of, like, majority and minority, it it also frames how you fit in socially. There are places right. where so-called minorities are actually the majority. That's right. And so this matters in, in terms of being seen and heard, but also, again, remedying very specific groups of people. Talk about the timing here, right? Why now? Well, there, there are new patterns of immigration. Uh, there are people who, who, again, want to be seen. But also, in the context of this bigger understanding of who we are as Americans, everyone wants to, to know that they are seen, heard, valued, um, but also kind of appreciated. But also, individuals say they should have the right um, to determine how they see themselves and how other people see them, not just some big bucket where everyone with brown skin or beige skin or white skin right. is lumped in together. Charmaine Lee, it's great reporting. Glad you're on top of it for us. Thank you. Still to come. We have to talk about it. Taylor Swift and her era's era that is now merely two plus hours away. I, can you stand it? Can you even handle the suspense? My God, that's next. <laughs> March Madness is upon us, day two, right? A whole bunch of college basketball games happening today. You have probably been watching them. Um, maybe you're even betting on them. I bet you are. Even if it's a couple bucks with friends, maybe a, like me, a Cadbury cream egg wager, like whatever you got, 68 million Americans are expected to bet on this thing. To put it in perspective, that is actually more people than bet on last month's Super Bowl. A lot of these folks are betting 
formally, right, legally, because sports betting is really taken off. How did that happen? Where is it happening? That is tonight's breakdown. Watch. <laughs> of Americans are expected to gamble on the March Madness games, according to the American Gaming Association. Some casually with friends, but some, they say, will place a formal bet online or in person at a shop or with a bookie. Sports gambling itself has been around for a significant amount of time. And what you're seeing is the growth of the legal part of the industry. In 1931, Nevada legalized gambling, and for decades, it was the only state in the country where you could make a legal sports bet, and plenty of people in Las Vegas did. That all changed in 2018, when the Supreme Court struck down the 1992 Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, opening the door for more states to legalize sports betting. More states did. Now it's legal in 33 states plus D.C. In three more, it's allowed but not yet operational. And another eight states are considering legalizing sports betting with bills or ballot initiatives. It can mean more money in those states' budgets. Five years ago, that tax revenue linked to sports betting was just $38 million. Last year, $1.5 billion. For a lot of folks, gambling can add some fun to the game, but there are risks. If, in fact, someone is gambling responsibly, I think you get greater engagement in the games. When it gets beyond that, that's where the problems can begin. A study in the Addictive Behaviors Journal found sports betting relative to non-sports betting has been more strongly linked to gambling problems. And because of those concerns, some states like Georgia have shut down sports betting bills. The issue with gambling is there's always a loser. That's part of it, right? Still, industry experts think there is going to be major growth around the world when it comes to sports betting. It's projected to reach something like $180 billion by 2030, according to Grandview Research. Another big event, not March Madness, but maybe Taylor Madness is starting as well. Swift Madness. What is the, the cheesiest name you can come up with about this? I don't know, but Taylor Swift is in Arizona for her Eras tour. First show, big stage. It is literally happening tonight. Like, as you are watching the show, people are, I think, tailgating in that parking lot. 70,000 people at State Farm Stadium in Glendale, Arizona, or technically Swift City. That is... That is literally what it's been renamed. It is Google Maps official, so you know it's real, at least for today. It's back to Glendale after the weekend, but some people are calling this a, a house of worship. That, I'm not calling it that, but some people are. This tour, remember, quite literally launched this war, I mean, not literally, but figuratively between fans and Ticketmaster. Anybody who wanted to get tickets remembers it all too well. The site crashed. There were hours of waiting in online lines, very high-priced retail tickets, a canceled general admission sale. There's been a lot of drama. Let's see if it's going to end tonight. Emily Aketa is out in Swift City. Hallie, you want to know just how serious Swift fandom is here? Look no further than Swift City. Yes, officials here actually changed the name of Glendale to Swift City today and tomorrow in honor of the mega star's massive tour. It's her first tour in five years and clearly causing a lot of excitement. She's actually toured here before at State Farm Stadium, but this is the first time officials say that there's been an artist performing back to back, and that's part of the reason why that officials here believe that we could see tour some traffic this weekend rivaled that of the Super Bowl, which was hosted here earlier this year. This all comes after that Ticketmaster meltdown. It led to those hours-long wait times, a lot of furious fans ending up without tickets. But for those who are lucky enough to be here tonight, they say that they are just shaking it off and they're ready to realize their wildest dreams. Take a listen. Oh, man, it's crazy. I mean, people are from Texas. We're from Utah. It's not just Glendale anymore. Like, it's it's opening night. It's everyone across the world, across the country, here for one night. Okay, so if you weren't lucky enough to score a ticket at this point, not all hope is lost. I'm really speaking to myself here because I didn't get a ticket in the pre-sale. There are still ways that you can find a way to see Taylor on tour on one of her 52 stops. One of them is check those secondary markets. Resell or StubHub, for instance, says they've seen about an average of 35% decline in the average cost of the ticket compared to the opening week. So you might actually get lucky there. You want to continue to refresh those sites. Also keep in mind, sign up for notifications for Taylor 
Swift's social media. Sometimes, Hallie, we see these artists while they're on tour actually launch these last minute giveaways. So there is still hope for me, you, and the others without tickets because undoubtedly we know this is going to be a big deal, a big night as she starts her first tour in five years. Hallie. Our thanks to Emily Aketa for that. I hope Emily gets to watch at least some of the tour. That's a wrap for this hour. More coverage picks up right now. We are coming on the air tonight with breaking news in just the last couple of minutes. New reporting that former President Donald Trump won't put up a fight if he is indicted. According to his lawyer, as NBC News can exclusively report on a new signal showing those criminal charges may come as early as next week, according to multiple sources. We'll explain in just a second. Then later in the show, you've got markets taking a tumble to end the week with some uncertainty around the banking system in this country. We'll tell you what the president says needs to happen now. Balls in the Capitol's court. Plus, former Theranos CEO Elizabeth Holmes is back in court today to try to delay when she has to report to prison for fraud. Why? Partly because she wants to take care of her baby. We'll tell you what the judge thinks about the case she's making. And the FBI announcing a $20,000 reward for a missing American woman who they say was kidnapped in Mexico. We're going to talk about what these recent cases of missing Americans means for the relationship between these two countries. Then, in our original big cities are finding it hard to get business districts back the way they were before the pandemic. We're going to explain later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight we are coming on the air with breaking news. We are just learning in the past couple of minutes here that former President Donald Trump will not put up a fight if if he is indicted and has to surrender to authorities. This is coming from an attorney for Mr. Trump talking with NBC News about what might happen, right? Essentially suggesting to NBC News, this attorney is, that there's not going to be some standoff at Mar-a-Lago. Why is this so important now? Because NBC News is exclusively reporting tonight that if an indictment were to come, it could happen maybe as early as next week, because that is what law enforcement agencies seem to be getting ready for. That scenario, according to five people who are familiar with those preparations, five senior law enforcement officials here. This is interesting, right? Because it means there's the potential for an indictment related to alleged hush punny payments that Mr. Trump made to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Okay, so we've laid out this first one, right? Indictment could come as early as next week. We've explained why and that there's an if here. There's a security plan, we understand, from local, state, and federal agencies if this happens and if former president does come to that Manhattan courthouse to face charges. This would be unprecedented. This would be historic in a big way. This has not happened. We have not had a former president who's been criminally charged before. And if you're like, Hallie, man, you got a lot of caveats here. You keep saying if, if he's indicted. That's just where the facts are right now. No charges have been filed yet. We don't know for sure that they will be. What we know is what we've laid out about preparations in case that were to happen. I want to bring in Laura Jarrett here. And Laura, it is very interesting reporting from our colleague Adam Reese here, speaking with one of Mr. Trump's attorneys, who says there's not going to be some, like, thing at Mar-a-Lago where they have to come get him if, in fact, he does need to face criminal charges. Talk us through what that would look like. So it had been an open question, I think, partly yeah. because of his oppositional stance to these cases to begin with. His position is all of these investigations are illegitimate, from the feds to the state. And so that was why I think there had been some question about whether, in fact, he would surrender if indicted. He hasn't been indicted. Nothing's been announced. But if that came to pass, that had been the open question. His lawyer, at least now, says... That's not going to be an issue. Remains to be seen how all this will exactly play out. But here's what would happen in the typical case. A person um, would be under investigation. The district attorney's office would then present the evidence, the charges to the grand jury. If the grand jury actually voted in favor of returning the indictment, that's known as a true bill. You can see it laid out here. You get 12 votes in favor of actually moving forward. Then the district attorney draws up the indictment. The grand juror four-person signs off on it. It eventually gets filed. But, Hallie, when it gets filed, it gets filed under seal. That means we do not see it. But at that point, we've now reached a critical juncture in which Trump's attorneys, a potential defendant, would be notified. They wouldn't be notified of the details, but they would say, come turn your client in. He should surrender. At that point, they'd have a date for him to come in. He would get fingerprinted. He would get processed. They would run a criminal background check on him. All that would happen behind closed doors. We would not see that. Got then it. eventually he would come to court for arraignment. We would see that, Hallie. 
That's uh, super helpful, Laura, and I just can't emphasize enough that it is all at this point, right, hypothetical so far because yes. we don't know for sure this is happening. What we do know is what our team here at NBC News is reporting exclusively, that law enforcement agencies are kind of getting ready for this, right? Yes, and, th and that's our understanding. Again, five sources, um, according to our colleague at WNBC, Jonathan Deans, first to report this news, that essentially these discussions are underway. Um, they're preliminary. They're, they've been described as precautionary essentially so that no one is caught flat-footed. When you have a, yeah. an investigation of this magnitude, this unprecedented, that this has never happened before, a former president, it's a big deal. And so obviously everyone wants to make sure that people are being safe, in particular around the courthouse in lower Manhattan. Jonathan is told they're trying to make sure in and around that or area. As you can imagine, it will be a madhouse if this comes to pass. We're not there yet, but if it did, they're trying to make sure everyone around the courthouse, in particular the court staff, the line prosecutors, the former president himself, they're trying to make sure everyone Everyone's protected and nobody is caught off guard. It is all coming, of course, as the former president is putting up his own kind of political defense strategy on this, preemptively calling these investigations a witch hunt. Laura Jarrett, thank you. We'll look for more of your reporting tonight on Nightly. I know you got to get to it. Appreciate it. Thanks. TikTok and its parent company are now under investigation for possible spying, according to a law enforcement source who's telling us this investigation comes after allegations that ByteDance, that Chinese parent company of TikToks, that ByteDance was tracking American journalists, surveilling illegally U.S. journalists, potentially. ByteDance says they've fired the employees responsible for this alleged scheme. They plan to cooperate with the investigation against them, any official investigations. And it's all coming against the backdrop of the Biden administration taking a tougher tone on TikTok, giving its parent company this ultimatum, kind of, saying, hey, either sell off TikTok or be banned in the U.S., that would be a big ban because about 100 million people in this country use TikTok. You probably have it on your phone right now. It's all ahead of what is expected to be an explosive hearing on Capitol Hill when TikTok's CEO testifies in front of a House committee. NBC's Sahil Kapoor is joining us now. So this investigation is interesting, and I want to be clear here. We've known, right, the, the idea that some journalists, specifically Forbes says two, at least two of their reporters had been surveilled, tracked by employees of ByteDance through their TikTok user app. Now we're learning that the DOJ and the FBI are officially investigating this, according to a law enforcement source, Sahil. That's right, Hallie. We don't know the full scope of this investigation. The DOJ and the FBI are not officially commenting on it, but we do know from a law enforcement source who spoke to our colleague, Ken Delanian, that the investigation does include reports uh, that ByteDance and TikTok were improperly spying on American journalists and accessing their data. So how did this happen? How did they end up doing this? Let's put up a chart that uh, illustrates this somewhat. First, employees noticed that there were internal leaks uh, to the press, employees of ByteDance. They gained access then to journalists IP addresses and other data through their TikTok accounts. Then they accessed information on the journalists contacts and then they used that data to determine the proximity uh, of that journalist with ByteDance employees. Now of course this began as you noted uh, as a result of a Forbes investigation by one of the journalists who said she was among those uh, who was spied on. ByteDance says it will cooperate with any investigation. In, in a statement they condemned the behavior of, of that employee uh, and they say they it, you know, um, they've strongly condemned that actions and they've removed, they've fired that uh, employee, Hallie. It all is happening ahead, just a few days now, ahead of this hearing that's going to happen on Thursday. And it matters because it's the first time the TikTok CEO is going to be on Capitol Hill, period. It's the first time since the Biden administration has taken a tougher tone. It's the first time since the U.S. has banned TikTok on government-owned devices in this country. Like, there is a lot that's been happening in the TikTok world with this bill moving forward now that would give President Biden more authority and his administration to take action against TikTok. In the face of all this, TikTok is, like, trying to go on offense. They're sending some creators to Washington to try to make the case. Yeah, TikTok seems to have realized that it's facing some serious legislative trouble on Capitol Hill, and they're scrambling to defend themselves. Let's put up a statement that a, a TikTok uh, spokesperson uh, gave to NBC News. They say, quote, lawmakers in Washington debating TikTok should hear firsthand from people whose lives would be directly affected by their decisions. We look forward to welcoming our creators to our nation's capital, helping them make their voices heard, and continuing to drive meaningful impact in their lives and for their communities. Now, Hallie, I got to tell you, TikTok does not have a lot of allies on 
on Capitol Hill. And it's remarkable. In a town where everyone has a lobbyist, even the most obscure causes end up gaining some allies, some traction on Capitol Hill. Our uh, Hill team cannot think of any lawmaker who's openly, outwardly, publicly defending TikTok, saying that there are no national security concerns, saying the app is safe and should be defended. This all comes down to a matter of how far Congress is willing to go, whether they're willing to go all the way and effectively ban it. We will get some answers, some glimpse uh, into where Congress is going next Thursday when the House Energy and Commerce Committee puts the TikTok CEO, Sho Chu, in the hot seat. Hallie? I, I, it's just so interesting to me, Sahil, because loyal viewers of this show will remember that before the, before the midterm elections, I had gone out with the team here at NBC News talking about the way that TikTok was playing on the campaign trail, right? And it, what we found a couple of Democrats, frankly, who were using TikTok, um, a couple of sort of state-level folks who were using TikTok, this question of who is the pro TikTok constituency is a real one because I'll tell you what, a lot of people in Gen, like I hate to sound old, but Gen Z, dude, this is where they get their news from. Like it is, and I wonder sometimes if, you know, there are these national security concerns that lawmakers raise, but who is talking about what a sort of sea change this will be for an entire generation of Americans if TikTok is banned? Right. I mean, there are lawmakers, to be clear, using TikTok right. on non-government devices, you know, through their political campaigns. It's got a massive user base. But there is nobody, remarkably, despite this huge base of young people in particular, who somebody could try to mobilize, uh, nobody's really, yeah. you know, poking their neck out there and saying, no, this app is fine, and, you know, positioning themselves as the defender of TikTok. This seems to be one issue, the, the idea of, you know, China and uh, the potential impact that a Chinese-owned app could have on the American populace if it gained this kind of data. Nobody really seems to be willing to cross that and use that as a political ploy when they are getting these classified briefings about the real dangers uh, that this could potentially have, Hallie. Sahil Kapoor, thank you very much. New tonight, the U.S. and Ukraine are applauding a new move by the International Criminal Court today. A big move from the ICC because they're trying to arrest Vladimir Putin. Yeah, they put out a warrant for his arrest because of what they say are war crimes that Putin committed in Ukraine. Crimes including illegally deporting and moving thousands of children, they say, from Ukraine to Russia. The Kremlin has long denied that, but another top Russian official is facing some similar charges. You've got Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, calling this move now historic. An historic decision in the midst of this devastating war. And the White House, in a statement, says Russia is doing this, is committing war crimes in Ukraine, that they support accountability. You also have a new statement into us just in the last little bit from the State Department, which echoes that sentiment. You know who's not echoing that? Well, it's Russia. That is not surprising. Basically brushing this whole thing off. The foreign minister's spokesperson saying today that Russia does not cooperate with the ICC and that warrants, they put warrants in quotes, would be legally null and void for Russia. It's all coming as we're learning more about the Chinese president's visit to Russia early next week. You see it there, Monday through Wednesday. Xi Jinping's first time in Russia since Putin invaded Ukraine. Let me get to uh, Ali Rafa, one of our White House correspondents who is joining us now. So a lot of reaction to this. And what I think is important for people to know, um, we, we are not, like, we are almost certainly not going to see Vladimir Putin in handcuffs being taken away by the ICC. Like, that's not what this is, because legally it would be tough to get to that point, um, just from a practical matter, I should say. Symbolically, it's a huge deal, and that's why you're seeing this new reaction from Ukraine tonight applauding this move, the White House coming out and saying, yes, we support it. Exactly. How do you even get President Putin to appear before Oh, he's trial not going to do it. There's no person. way, right? Like, there's no way exactly. that happens. But the White House is saying that this is still a big step. This is still, like you said, symbolically very powerful. But they're acknowledging that this is the base, the minimum that the ICC can do, considering President Putin has been accused for years now right. of war crimes. The vice president uh, a couple weeks ago accused him of crimes against humanity. So the U.S. is saying we have uh, bigger goals here in holding him accountable. But at the very least, this is the minimum that the ICC can do at this point. It's also interesting timing here, because on Monday, Xi Jinping, the leader of China, is going to go to Russia for the first first time since the invasion of Ukraine began. And China, I think, is starting to see itself as the potential for this, to play this peacemaker role, but brokering peace maybe between Russia and Ukraine. There's a lot of skepticism that that could actually happen. You're seeing these tensions rise between the U.S., China, and Russia as And the it's US. not like there weren't already tensions. Correct. Like, those already existed. They're just rising as you're starting to see the Western alliance get stronger and more commitments by different countries behind Ukraine for as long as this war is going to last. You're seeing all of that as aggression by Russia escalates. 
U.S. officials are scared that China could potentially be the one that provides lethal military aid to Russia as it seeks more aid, even though they're playing yeah. peacemaker here. We saw China host those peace talks between Iran and Saudi Arabia last week. Now they're putting themselves in the middle of this peacemaking deal, supposedly, between Ukraine and Russia. The U.S. is saying, not so fast, let's get a gut check here. Don't believe everything you hear. Mm. Uh, I want you to take a listen to what uh, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby told our colleague Kristen Welker earlier today. If they go to a ceasefire, and not only does that certify and validate the conquest that Russia has made to date, it gives Mr. Putin time to refit, to retrain, to re-equip, and maybe even restart operations at a time and place of his choosing. The U.S. and Kirby also saying that if China is seriously considering these peace talks, it should give President Zelensky in Ukraine the same amount of attention and opportunity for That's communication right. as it's giving Russia as they prepare to have this three-day-long meeting. Ali Raf, a lot to be thinking about and talking about, I know, over the weekend and next week. Thank you so much. Good to see you. you. Let's get to weather now because the threat of a really bad storm moving east today. It is now headed for the Gulf Coast with a lot of wind, some hail, even the possibility of tornadoes. This is happening less than 24 hours after a confirmed tornado touched down in Texas. You also saw some places hit. Look at how big this hail is. Look at it on the left. Like, I mean, that's like the minivan gives you some size perspective there. They look like golf ball size, don't they? On the right is the aftermath of it. Windows shattered. You see some of that stuff on the lawn that's all messed up. Some trees fell on houses. Fences fell over because of how windy it was. I want to bring in our NBC News meteorologist, Angie Lassman. So what is the expectation for folks down south and along the Gulf? Yeah, not quite as, uh, you know, damaging as what it was yesterday, Hallie. So that's a good news there. But this, this system is just quite simply not done yet. It continues to move to the east. And we do have some uh, watches this mornings that have been posted throughout the day. The ones that are active still right now are in parts of southeastern Alabama it does include Dothan. This is going to go until 545 Central Time. So if you are in this area, we're seeing a severe thunderstorm war a severe thunderstorm warning that has been issued because this line of thunderstorms continues to march to the east. We're talking strong winds, not looking at a tornado in this area, but still the strong winds up to 60 miles per hour could be damaging. So finding a safe place to be is going to be your best bet. And we're not done with this system just yet. Over the next uh, couple of hours, we're going to see the threat for the strong to even severe storm last into the evening hours tonight, mainly focused into parts of the Florida Peninsula or the Florida Panhandle rather into parts of, of Alabama and stretching anywhere uh, through the southeast here as we go through the next day or so. This is going to be something we'll see even into the early hours of tomorrow. This does include those strong winds, the hail up to an inch in size and even maybe an isolated tornado. We also have the heavy rain, Hallie. This is going to be something that could potentially cause some flooding concerns. We've already seen it through the afternoon hours, areas like Montgomery, Mobile, up to an inch of rain, and we already know that those grounds are saturated, so this will be something to watch. Not to mention that cold front that is responsible for all of this kind of gets stuck into the northern portions of Florida as we go into our Saturday. So this is the area through the early part of our weekend that we'll be watching for some substantial rainfall and potential flooding, and not to mention interrupting some of those maybe St. Patty's Day weekend plans as we go into Saturday, Hallie. Angie Lassman, thank you very much for that look. Uh, I'm sure I'll be talking again. Appreciate it. So tonight you've got President Biden calling on Congress to do something to make people feel a little bit better about all of this financial drama we've been talking about, the uncertainty in the banking system here in this country. It's affecting the markets. You've got the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ all in the red. The Dow was down closing today, something like roughly 400 points. You see it there. And now the president says in a statement he wants Congress to green light a bill that would make it easier for the government to punish any executives involved in bank failures, like the one that happened about a week ago. He says nobody is above the law. But here's the thing. Some members of Congress, they are not so sure that a new law is actually the solution. Well, I think you want to get all the facts, but it seems as though the regulators didn't do their job. I don't know if they need to do like legislation. And new fallout tonight, even a week after Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, we're now finding out that its parent company is filing for bankruptcy protection. 
Brian Chung remains on the financial drama beat. Um, and Brian, it's not going anywhere anytime soon, right? Because the president wants Congress to do a couple of big things to stop this from happening again. Is it realistic? Do you think it'll go anywhere? Yeah, let's recap exactly what the president is asking for here. Again, all of this is supposed to be uh, providing a little bit more accountability on executives of failed banks. So when you take a look at the detail of what he's proposing specifically, it's first of all, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corp. Corporation. He wants them to have more ability to claw back bonuses from CEOs of failed banks. And he also wants to lower the threshold by which you can bar bank executives from a future employment at other banks, even after uh, allowing a bank to fail. And then lastly, giving regulators more authority to sue bank executives for civil penalties. It's not that the FDIC and regulators can't do this right now. It's that there are some uh, technicalities around the size of the bank that fails and the way that the bank is ultimately uh, resolved that allows these regulators regulators to only pursue these types of punitive uh, uh, measures. But again, the Biden administration wanting to lower that, but it's going to require an act of Congress. It'll be interesting to see if he can do that in a mixed Congress, especially with that quote we just heard from Kevin McCarthy. <laughs> I don't have to. It is not breaking news to people watching this show that it is Friday night, right? But what's interesting as we head into this weekend is to think about last weekend. And last weekend, there were a lot of people freaking out because there were huge question marks about what was going to happen with that bank collapse, whether the administration was going to step in. We know what happened there. You had 11 banks kind of riding to the rescue. Recently, a First Republic bank, a different bank people were worried about. Their shares dipped again today. Getting out of the weeds a little bit, like tell us what the expectation is for, let's say, next week. Are people going to be in panic mode? Is it time to like take a deep breath here? Help us understand that. Yeah, on a personal note, I mean, this week has felt like a year. There's been so much stuff that happened. But yeah, I mean, it's only last weekend that we I saw this. Wait, two Brian, I love that you preface that with on a personal note. Yeah, like for, for everybody, though, right? I mean, for, for you reporting it, but for people who have money in the markets, too, you know? Yeah, but I mean, you know, look, when we look at the stock market, just like how the stock market is not the economy, well, right. bank stocks are not the health, uh, a metric of health for these banks. And we have to remember that. If an investor is looking at the banking uh, industry right now and saying, I don't want to be exposed to this bank, well, then they're going to sell the stock. That's not necessarily a referendum on whether or not they feel that bank has proper liquidity or has proper capital. And that's really important to remember as we watch the sell-off, for example, in the stocks that happened on this Friday. The overall stock market fell, but yeah. the bank stocks got shellacked as well. That's going to be an interesting thread to watch next week, but it's going to be very noisy because we have a lot of economic threads to pull as well. Federal Reserve has a meeting that will decide on interest rates Oof. on Wednesday. That's right. So we're going to be teeing up to that, I am sure, for much of the week. What's the over-under on your cocktails tonight when you get home, Brian? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, let's say two. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you. <laughs> See you next week. Yeah. There's a new sign tonight that Hunter Biden's legal team is shifting to a more aggressive strategy, going on offense and filing a lawsuit, a countersuit for invasion of privacy against one of the people who they say accessed Hunter Biden's data without permission. Mr. Biden's legal team targeting the owner of a computer repair shop, part of a broader push, it seems, by the team around the president's son to toughen up the tone, if you will as House Republicans ramp up their own high-profile investigations into Hunter Biden. Our investigative correspondent, Sarah Fitzpatrick, is joining us now. And Sarah, talk about um, what's behind what seems to be, as you have framed it in your reporting here, a shift in tone more aggressively from Hunter Biden's team. I think there's a couple things behind it. I think the first thing is Hunter Biden has been waiting for several years. He's been mainly silent. He's waiting only... for what? Waiting, I think, for a moment to come out and be more aggressive, to correct the record. You know, all sorts of things have been said, some of which are accurate, some of which he believes are not. I think what's behind it is an effort to establish a clear legal record, a record of statements that have been made by uh, Trump-aligned individuals to make a record of um, forensic evidence. Today, we saw a um, disclosure with the, co with the court in Delaware saying that they were intending to perhaps use subpoenas to get Rudy Giuliani, Steve Bannon under oath about their involvement in the dissemination of Hunter Biden's electronic data. So I think what's behind it is a kind of multifaceted approach in the civil courts, in potentially with criminal prosecutors, and also just in the court of public opinion, making mm. sure that um, there's a correct and clear record. 
It's interesting you talk about the court of public opinion because it seems like some members of Congress have their eye on that as well. Some of these Republican-led investigations in the House of Representatives that only got a chance to even exist because Republicans took the House right. of Representatives in the midterm. So we've just been seeing that in the last you know couple of months. Right. We've seen a really aggressive push, particularly by the House Oversight Committee. They are they have intended that they're going to go after Hunter Biden, Hunter Biden's finances, mm -hmm. and they've said their ultimate goal is Joe Biden. But we haven't seen them yet truly, they haven't subpoenaed Hunter Biden. They haven't really gone after kind of key people around him or the president. We're seeing kind of periphery uh, kind of things that have been in the public record that they're kind of putting back in. They have not yet subpoenaed him. And I think that remains to be seen whether or not that will actually happen. Or is Hunter Biden's team bracing for the potential for that kind of subpoena? Do we know or can we not say yet? I, I don't think we can say it. I think we can say that they are preparing for all kind of outcomes yeah. and eventualities. But I think that they are going to be much more assertive going forward. And once they have a kind of legal record, they can point to things under oath that may be able to help them in Congress. Sarah Fitzpatrick, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Coming up here on the show, the trouble for the Murdoch family may not be over, but the family of one South Carolina teen who died mysteriously just miles from the Murdoch home is now saying tonight. That's coming up in the five things. Plus, we've told you about huge protests in France. Look at those. Well, now President Macron is making a big move. It's making a lot of people mad. We'll tell you what it, tell you more all about that next. Ford is out with a big recall tonight. We'll tell you what you should know if you have a Ford car or truck. That's in the five things. But first, today you had a judge in the Elizabeth Holmes Theranos case saying he needs more time to decide if she'll have to report to prison at the end of April. Holmes wants to stay out of prison while she appeals, and that's making a lot of news. She's arguing in part that they, she should not be behind bars because she has a baby, just a few months old, basically. She gave birth to her second child earlier this year. Her lawyers are arguing, you see it here, she's not a flight risk, they say, or a danger to the community, so she should be allowed to stay at home for now. Holmes, remember, had told everybody, including top investors in Theranos, that she'd created a system to detect a variety of health issues with just a drop of blood. That wasn't true, turns out. And that is fraud. She was hit with a more than 11-year sentence for it. If a judge rules against her next month, Holmes will have to report to prison at the end of April. Obviously, there are many pregnant people who have had to report to prison, right? Much less people with babies. 58,000 still pregnant women are admitted each year. I want to bring in now uh, one of our NBC News legal contributors, if you will, legal analysts, and attorney Angela Senadella, who's joining us now, help us read the tea leaves from the judge. He says he needs more time to think about it. Do, do judges usually find in favor of motions like these if they can have lawyers who effectively make the case that somebody's not a flight risk? Well, Hallie, it's certainly an unusual request, but it's what you expect the defense to do, which is to try to keep her out of prison for as long as possible. And it's important to note they're not saying that she should never go to prison. They're just saying that she should not go to prison until the appeal. So if that appeal then turns out to be in the favor of Elizabeth Holmes, then she might never actually have to face this prison time. But what the judge will look at here is, as you said, the flight risk and the prosecutors here are saying, look, last Last year, she bought a one-way ticket to Mexico and didn't even alert the authorities mm. until they found out. So that's what the judge is going to be weighing here. Does our judges, t and like again, I don't mean to overgeneralize, Angela, but like when it comes to the question of a woman with a baby, right, a newborn, we have no idea if, you know, what, what Elizabeth Holmes is doing as it relates to, you know, feeding her child, like whatever. But is a judge typically sympathetic in that case, or could there be sort of the, this that angle that, that's at play here? Yes, absolutely. Judges do tend to be sympathetic, but the request has to be made by the defense team. And we saw here that the judge actually had the hearing in November, but didn't start her sentence until April, and in that interim, she had the baby. So it's likely the judge already took that into consideration. But now, what's going to happen next? Will the judge say, look, I already gave you some leeway mm. because of that time? Or is the judge going to give more leeway because the judge is really going to be that sympathetic to mothers? In some ways, and it's, I think, important to point this out, 
this can only even happen, the possibility that a judge could even hear a request like this, if a defendant has enough money and is well-funded enough and has the resources to make the argument in the first place, right? Yes, absolutely. And that is the benefit of having resources to be able to hire extensive defense teams. And we even saw this with her buddy, her partner in crime, Sonny, that he was able to get an automatic stay on his sentence in a similar way because he had such an extensive defense team. So it's not always equal, Hallie. Angela Zanadella, thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Good to see you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, check out what it looks like in France tonight. After the French leader, Emmanuel Macron, forced a very unpopular, well, unpopular with these demonstrators, retirement plan through Parliament. It raises the retirement age from 62 to 64. That is why workers have been on strike for weeks now. Labor leaders say, hey, we want new strikes also. It's affected everything from transportation to trash collection. Number two, there's an update tonight in the death of a South Carolina teenager that may have a connection to the family of Alec Murdoch. The mother of Stephen Smith says she's planning to have his body exhumed for an independent autopsy. How he died got a lot more attention after Alec Murdoch's arrest and murder conviction in what some down south call the double murder trial of the century. In 2015, Smith was found dead on a road about 15 miles from the Murdoch property. Investigators say they received tips that Murdoch's living son, Buster, may have been connected. Today, South Carolina officials are saying they've made progress in the investigation into Smith's death and that it remains active and ongoing. Number three, police at the northern border are warning about a record number of migrant crossings from Canada. The migrants are mostly from Mexico, and they can legally get to Canada without visas before trying to illegally cross into the U.S. Border Patrol says about 2,000 people made that cold and dangerous crossing this winter. That's nearly 10 times the number we saw at the same time last year. Number four, Ford has put out two big recalls today, about 1.3 million Fusions and Lincoln MKXs are at risk of leaky brake hoses. Ford's also recalling more than 200,000 Ford F-150s where the windshield wipers are easily breakable. You can get both parts replaced at a dealership. Number five, look at the White House celebrating St. Patrick's Day tonight, wearing green, proverbially. You might be wearing green as well. The Prime Minister of England gave the, uh, excuse me, Prime Minister of Ireland gave President Biden a bunch of shamrocks. That's a guy from One Direction who's also giving a special performance, and the fountain is green. Another big event beginning as well, Swifties. Okay, I gotta be, I'm not, listen guys, I'm gonna level with you. This is how we do it on the show. The producer who wrote this, Lauren Mamini, is a huge Taylor Swift fan, and she took it upon herself to put in as many Taylor Swift lyrics as possible into this introduction. I told, I'm gonna read it as she wrote it. I don't know any Taylor Swift lyrics, but she says that now is not the time to calm down because in three hours, Taylor Swift is taking the stage for the first show of her Eras tour, her first tour in five years. About 70,000 people will be living out their wildest dreams at the State Farm Stadium in Glendale, Arizona, AKA Swift City. That is literally what it's been renamed. It is Google Maps official. It's gone so far as to be labeled a place of worship. Let's not forget this tour created some bad blood between fans and Ticketmaster. If you wanted to get tickets, you remember it all too well. The site crashed with hours of waiting in online lines, very high-priced retail tickets, a canceled general admission sale. Let's bring in NBC's Phoenix affiliate reporter, Bianca Bono. I don't know if you're a Taylor Swift mega fan like our producers are, but I am like totally intrigued by the scene behind you. It feels like we've been talking about this tour for months because we have been with all that Ticketmaster drama, everything else. How long have the people behind you been camped out there and are they like so excited to finally be able to get in the doors in about an hour from now? Hallie, good afternoon. I am a proud Swifty, and that introduction was incredible. But yes, the city has been preparing for months. Just last month, we hosted the Super Bowl here. I will tell you that tonight is going to give the big game a run for its money because around the same amount of people are expected. 70,000 Swifties planning to pack in to State Farm Stadium. And I will tell you, Taylor Swift actually kicked off her last tour right here in Glendale. It was called the University of Phoenix Stadium at the time. So the community has a 
lot of pride that she picked Arizona again. That's why you saw the mayor of Glendale on Monday, Monday renaming Glendale as Swift City. Our Department of Transportation has been planning and dealing with some not so swift traffic today. They've had a lot of fun with some freeway signs, lots of Taylor Swift puns. Restaurants and bars have renamed menu items in honor of Taylor Swift. Fans decorated their cars. They made their own outfits. They are so excited. This line, by the way, it's not to get inside. It's just to buy merch. Let's talk oh about tickets. Oh, my God. Yes, no. Fans had to fight Don't tooth even and nail to get a ticket to tonight's show. <laughs> I am not kidding. If they had to fight tooth and nail to get a ticket for tonight's show. I checked about an hour ago. There are a few tickets left, but when I say a few, Hallie, I mean very few tickets left for tonight's concert. I'm completely obsessed with this, and I have to ask you, and I know we're on a little bit of a satellite delay because you are live in Glendale, but Bianca, I think people like to know, as the reporter who gets to cover this, does this also mean you get to go inside and watch the concert? <laughs> I do get to sneak in. I'm hoping to catch at least 20 to 30 minutes of the show. I know I definitely drew the long straw today. I know it's St. Patrick's Day, but Swifties, if you're watching, you'll understand the Lavender Hayes reference that we have with the outfit going on. Uh, but yes, I'm so excited to see it for myself. The excitement has been building in the Valley for a long time. The fans are in great spirits. Hallie, I talked to a group of girls that drove 15 hours from Northern California just because they wanted to be at the very first show. Go for it. You know what? We love to see it. I love to see you getting to go, getting the best assignment of the night there in, uh, in Arizona. Bianca, thank you so much. Have fun tonight. And we come back. Uh, we're turning to other news internationally, including what the FBI says is another American missing in Mexico. You'll hear from her daughter about what she thinks happened next. Your next apartment might be in an old office building. We'll talk about the post-pandemic push from some big cities and how successful it is or is not. That's in tonight's original in a minute. But first, the FBI is offering a $20,000 reward for information on a missing American woman who they say was kidnapped in Mexico, as we're just hearing from her daughter about a possible ransom that her kidnappers are asking for. Listen. We miss you. And we can't wait to have you home safe. We did receive and we were able to hear what sounds to us like a recording of her. Incredibly emotional moments for her family there. Keep in mind, it's happening right after four Americans were just kidnapped. And of course, what turned out to be a deadly kidnapping, an apparent case of mistaken identity. Two of those Americans were killed. Right now, three other women for Texas are missing after crossing the border into Mexico to sell clothes back in February. And while that sounds like a lot of cases, it is merely a fraction of them. The Washington Post reports more than 550 Americans are missing right now in Mexico. I want to bring in Dana Griffin. So talk to us about uh, the, the woman who the FBI is offering this reward for. Are they making any progress in that investigation? Hi, Hallie. So 63-year-old Maria del Carmen Lopez was taken from her home in Mexico 36 days ago. She's a great grandmother who frequently goes back and forth from Mexico to Southern California. The FBI says this was not connected to drugs. Lopez's daughter says that there were witnesses during the midday kidnapping and that ransom demand. It's unclear if the family has paid the ransom, but here's how they say it all went down. They got off of the truck. They had their, they had hoods on their heads and they exchanged some words. They said they did hear my mom say and plead that she was not going to go with them. She would not go. And like you mentioned, the FBI is offering a $20,000 reward for information. The agency has a longstanding policy of not paying ransoms. However, they do help facilitate if a victim's family chooses to pay. Hallie. Talk to me about the broader sort of geopolitical picture here, Dana, because there is the question of the relationship and the cooperation between the U.S. and Mexico on other issues, too, like, for example, fentanyl. And there is some news today on that mm -hmm. front coming from the Mexican leader here. Talk us through it. Yeah, so today Mexico's president said that the U that U.S. families were to blame for the fentanyl overdose crisis because they don't hug their kids enough. He's falsely stated that none of the dangerous drug is produced in Mexico. Hallie. Dana Griffin, live for us in L.A. Dana, thank you very much. To tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. 
And if you live in a big city in this country, even if you don't, you probably know that big cities are struggling to get business districts back on their feet. San Francisco, for example, has only reached just over 30 percent of the activity downtown that it had before the pandemic, according to a couple of recent studies. A lot of reason for that is because work from home changed what our cities look like. You've got what's kind of a graveyard of these empty office buildings. So now big cities are trying to adapt by turning that gray cubicle maybe into this, your next apartment. Zinkle Esimwa took a look at how one city is doing just that. Watch. Gary Cohen's grandfather bought this D.C. office building nearly 60 years ago. This was the first high-rise office building in this part of town. Soon, it will make history as the first high-rise multifamily residential building in Washington's business district. The office market um, wasn't that great even before COVID, but then when COVID happened, it, it pretty much died. Cohen is chairman of D.C. area developer Wilco, an owner of the building soon to be known as L Apartments. It's one of five office to residential conversions happening in Washington, D.C.'s Golden Triangle, marking a growing trend in cities nationwide. Today, office attendance is less than half of what it was pre-pandemic in some of the largest metro areas struggling to lure workers back in person. Neighborhoods where people live have been a lot more resilient than neighborhoods that have only one use. Leona Agaritas is executive director of the Golden Triangle Business Improvement District in Washington, D.C. She says building vacancy in the area is at 22 percent, a historic high. The Golden Triangle includes 34 million square feet of office space and only 36 residential units. Agaritas says with remote work here to stay, cities need new revenue streams like Cohen's project. After a three-year vacancy, the building will have 163 residential units. This is a unit right here. And 8,000 square feet of retail, an endeavor catching the eye of D.C.'s mayor. We encourage more property owners to uh, follow their lead. Mayor Muriel Bowser announcing plans for an abatement program in December, intended to incentivize office-to-apartment building conversions, address the affordable housing crisis, and revitalize the business district. Still, office-to-apartment conversions are no silver bullet. What are some of the challenges of converting an office building into yeah. an apartment space? It's endless. New plumbing, new electrical, new mechanical. So you're doing a lot of core drilling. It's about a $65 million job. But Cohen says the costs are worth it. What do you think your grandfather would make of what this building is becoming today? I think it's kind of interesting. It's come full circle. The building likely ready in 2024 as how we work continues to affect where we live. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News, Washington, D.C. Coming up, hundreds of thousands of people are protesting in Israel. We'll tell you why there's a move that has the country's president warning of a civil war. Plus, a former pro just broke the record for the world's longest surf session. Where do you find out how long and where? It's coming up in the Global. Hundreds of thousands of Israelis are planning to hit the streets again tomorrow to protest, upset about Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's plan to basically overhaul the country's whole judicial system. The demonstrators say, well, wait a second, that gets rid of checks and balances. They say it gives too much power to the prime minister. Those critics also worry that Netanyahu is doing this, is trying to make these changes to get himself out of the corruption charges he faces. The demonstrations have been happening for months, almost three months, but there's new fuel for these protesters tomorrow after Netanyahu turned down a compromise from Israel's president this week. The president now says Netanyahu's move could lead to civil war, a serious warning. NBC's Raf Sanchez is joining us now. Raf, as with so many things uh, and issues in the Middle East, this one is complicated, right? What do Americans need to know about what's happening there? So, Hallie, it is complicated, but it basically boils down to a fight over checks and balances. In the U.S., we have a clear separation of powers, executive, legislative, judicial branches. Here in Israel, the executive and the judicial, the legislative, rather, kind of fuse together. Netanyahu is the prime minister. He is the head of the executive branch because he and his allies have a majority in parliament, the legislative branch. And so the Supreme Court is really the only check on the government's power. And Netanyahu is saying the Supreme Court has become overly powerful. It is infringing on the domain of the democratically elected government. And he says it needs to be cut down to size. But Hallie, the protesters who are out on the streets in their hundreds of thousands are saying 
if that happens, if the Supreme Court is weakened, then there is really no check on the power of the government, and there is basically nothing to protect the, the rights of citizens from an overpowerfully, overly powerful executive. Hallie. Can you talk through, Raf, like what would be the ripple effects? In other words, what are the international dominoes that could fall from all this? So the U.S. is very concerned about this, right, because Israel is a close ally. Whenever you have U.S. officials from President Biden on down here, they talk about the U.S. and Israel sharing both interests and values, and democracy is one of those values. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin was here the other week. His trip, Hallie, was actually kind of disrupted by these mass protests blocking the roads. And he made it very clear the Biden administration is very concerned about what's happening here. They are worried about Israel's Supreme Court being weakened. And it was interesting, Hallie, Israel's finance minister, a very senior member of the Israeli government, was in Washington over the weekend, and not a single U.S. official met with him. That is partly because he is from a far-right, largely fringe party here in Israel. But I think it is also a sign about mm. how worried the U.S. is about the situation here. That is super interesting. This is going to come to a head potentially at the end of this month, right, just a couple of weeks from now. What's the timeline then from there? In other words, what are we looking at in April, May, beyond? We're looking at uncharted territory. So mm. it looks like Netanyahu has the votes. It looks like he has the will to force this through parliament. But, Hallie, there is every possibility they're going to pass this law. The Supreme Court is going to strike it down. And then we are potentially looking at a constitutional crisis. Really, no one in this country, the legal scholars we talk to, no one happens, no one knows what happens at that point. If Parliament is saying the Supreme Court needs to be weakened and the Supreme Court is saying you can't do that. So things are really alarming here. And I think all eyes are on the more centrist members of Netanyahu's government to see if any of them may buckle under this pressure, not just the protesters on the streets, but the leaders of Israel's high-tech industry saying they're concerned, they're thinking about taking their businesses out of the country. And also these elite members of Israel's military reserves, these fighter pilots, who are saying they potentially would refuse to show up to training, potentially refuse mm. to follow orders if they feel that Israel is no longer a democracy. Hallie? Uh, as, you, as you say, Raf, and you're right, it, it is uncharted territory here that we're getting into. Um, Raf Sanchez, Thank you for being all over for us from Israel tonight. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our foreign desk has done it for you. Here is some of what they're keeping an eye on in a new segment we call The Global. In Greece, veterinarians are fighting to save a white tiger cub found abandoned in a trash can at the Athens Zoo last month. This so well, tiger's only a few months old. Zoo officials think it's a victim of the illegal wildlife trade. They say this little, this little cub was all thin and dehydrated when they found it. They're trying to get that cub back to a good place. In Dubai, check out this pretty epic video. A pilot from, a pilot from Poland making aviation history this week. That's a chopper pad and that's a plane. The plane lands successfully on the helipad of a famous hotel. This is a specially adapted light aircraft that's stopped in just 68 feet. The landing pad itself is only 89 feet wide. That's bananas that that guy just did that. In Australia, another bananas moment. Former pro surfer Blake Johnston setting a new world record for the longest surf session. Not like five hours or six hours or 12 or 40 hours, four zero. He caught 600 waves, so incredible. Happened off the coast of Australia. He did all of this to raise money for mental health initiatives for kids. Very cool. Still to come, sports betting has become a huge thing in this country, especially when it comes to March Madness. We're breaking down how he got here next. Whole bunch of college basketball games are happening today and all month long in one of the biggest events to bet on in this country. 68 million of us are expected to bet in some way on the NCAA basketball tournament. To put that in perspective, that's more than last month's Super Bowl. So sports betting is really taken off, right? How many people might jump in? What does it mean? How did we get here? That's tonight's breakdown. <laughs> of Americans are expected to gamble on the March Madness games, according to the American Gaming Association. 
300. Some casually with friends, but some, they say, will place a formal bet online or in person at a shop or with a bookie. Sports gambling itself has been around for a significant amount of time. And what you're seeing is the growth of the legal part of the industry. In 1931, Nevada legalized gambling, and for decades, it was the only state in the country where you could make a legal sports bet, and plenty of people in Las Vegas did. That all changed in 2018, when the Supreme Court struck down the 1992 Professional and Amateur Sports Protection Act, opening the door for more states to legalize sports betting. More states did. Now it's legal in 33 states plus D.C. In three more, it's allowed but not yet operational and another eight states are considering legalizing sports betting with bills or ballot initiatives. It can mean more money in those states' budgets. Five years ago, that tax revenue linked to sports betting was just $38 million. Last year, $1.5 billion. For a lot of folks, gambling can add some fun to the game, but there are risks. If, in fact, someone is gambling responsibly, I think you get greater engagement in the games. When it gets beyond that, that's where the problems can begin. A study in the Addictive Behaviors Journal found sports betting relative to non-sports betting has been more strongly linked to gambling problems. And because of those concerns, some states like Georgia have shut down sports betting bills. The issue with gambling is there's always a loser. Still, industry experts think that there's going to be a lot of growth around the world when it comes to sports betting, projected to reach $180 billion by 2030, according to Grandview Research. How are your brackets? Are they busted? Are you feeling good? Take a look. Let me know. Get online. Get at me. We'll talk about it next week when I will see you Monday, same time, same place. Top Story with Tom Yamas picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.